Now, we ended this morning's session with a kind of polarity between toys for the boys and a kind of essential, essential natural femininity, which maybe some of us might want to um, problematise as, as the afternoon wears on. But certainly, it's there for debate. But this afternoon's session examines the, mel the merging, the melting, the relationship between human beings and machines. And it's particularly a kind of feminism which takes this as an optimistic scenario. The cyborg, not the goddess, will survive in Donna Haraway's piece and will be there to be celebrated. Well, let's have a look as we proceed through this afternoon. What's going to happen now is that I'm going to introduce Helen Cadwallader, who will talk us through um, some um, computer-mediated communication technology between women and machines. And after she's spoken, we'll, I'll introduce you to Christine Tamblin, whose work, She Loves It, She Loves It Not, Women and Technology, will be the subject of her talk. We'll then move on to listen to Pat Cadigan and then Sadie Plant. But for the moment, Helen Cadwallader. Thank you. OK, well, before I, um, I present Pat Naldi and Wendy Kirkup's project work, um, I'd just like to explain my relationship with these artists. Um, I'm a freelance curator and I'm currently researching a mixed group exhibition of women artists' work which uses or explores advanced technologies around specific cultural issues. Now, the title of the exhibition is Simulated Identities and the aim here is to open up cultural debates around advanced technologies through referencing some of the concerns which women artists in particular are exploring, namely sexual difference and gender politics, sexuality and ethnicity. Um, one further aim of the exhibition is to expose and explore the ideological orientation underpinning advanced technologies which too often are assumed to be neutral, cited within the scientific as opposed to the cultural sphere. So uh, in terms of the work of the artists Pat Naldi and Wendy Kirkup, they've been working together collaboratively for about three to four years. And these artists have been engaged in research and producing art projects which utilise computer-mediated communications and systems from exploring inner-city surveillance systems to citizen band style computer chat lines. And um, it's this kind of work which I'm going to be presenting today. Um, yeah, the current research and projects uh, that uh, you'll be seeing today involve using the American software CompuServe accessed through using a modem computer and as a result, the artist's current work has been characterised in terms of text, language, narrative and a constant play with notions of gender identity and sexuality. Through this software, they've utilised the citizen band simulation option, which is very similar to the internet relay chat conversational channels, which uh, can be used in, particularly through American software. Now, users of the, C the CB simulation option operate on an international framework transgressing language and cultural differences, as well as time zones, 24 hours a day. Users of this option usually assume pseudonyms or handles in order to identify themselves to others. And as users can't be seen or heard, they appear on screen in the form of text only. As a result, any identity can be assumed. Given this, the artists have adopted the handle SIS, or CIS, in order to interact with the CB option. Now, while such a handle hints towards an abbreviation of the term sister, the artists uh, haven't exact, have never actually divulged an exact um, explanation of this acronym, and they certainly would never attempt to do so when interacting with users on the CB line. The idea behind this is that CIS becomes a fictional identity with no clearly delineated gender or sexual positioning. The absence of the material body, then, through computer-mediated communications, has enabled these artists, along with other CB simulation users, to enter into and explore a constantly shifting, almost fictional world of assumed identities. And it's at this point I'd like us now to refer to the screen. So if we could have the lights down, please. Right, the, this, this first page of text, um, this is kind of like... This sums up a typical conversation that uh, the artists will engage with when they first enter into it, the system. The system that they're using here, the chat line rather, is the Alternative Lifestyles chat line. Um, and immediately what you'll see is that um, other users will want to know what CIS means, quite, quite rightly so. And they just want to find out exactly what um, it, the, the exact translation. And of course, the artists play around with, um, with what the, this term can, can mean. And I'm just going to move on 
move on now to gender alternatives. This is another conversation. And this is, how, um, this is what you'll be seeing now over the next few minutes, is different conversations that the artists have collected. Um, they, they got into conversation with this character called Zeus, um, and they immediately, the artists immediately realised that they'd got hold of somebody who had quite deliberately chosen um, the, this image of a Greek god that can change in some way or other, and therefore perhaps they could explore this issue of uh, changing or shifting identities with this character. <coughs> And uh, they get to this point here, where they ask Zeus, does this mean that he could be a man or a woman? And uh, this character, Zeus, very definitely is a man, and isn't going to entertain any, any form of uh, doubt on that issue. And again, they're exploring the idea of being able to cross physical, geographical boundaries. Is that okay? Have you read that text now? <coughs> right, and they're just playing around again with the idea of wizardry. And uh, Cis here points to the fact that it's an oxymore. Um, the idea that Cis is, means the same thing either way you, uh, you look at that word. Right. <coughs> This bit I'm not going to talk about, so I'm just going to. Oh no! Oh no! I am actually. I thought I edited this one out. No, no, no. This this is a very important part actually. This is private box. Now normally uh, the artists find the most interesting conversations they have accessing chat lines, gender alternatives, and lifestyle alternatives, um, because the users on those um, chat lines tend to be cross-dressers or transsexuals and the kinds of issues that uh, they're willing to explore, they're much more accessible to exploring uh, slightly more transgressive issues. Now here, um, cis come across this character called Quasimodum. Um, and again, that's quite an interesting name. Uh, and she immediately wants to find out whether or not cis are female. Right, and now here, this is an interesting bit where Cosimodum says she's not specific about whether she's a female or a, or a male. I've automatically assumed that, it's, it's, that this person is a female. Um, and the reason why I, th I think she's definitely a female is because she goes on to, to explain here about the problems that can arise once you pinpoint exactly whether you're a uh, male or female. She says here, well, if I say I'm female, I'm, I'm either excluded from serious talk or I'm hassled. Well, of course, this is a commentary on the, um, on the nature of the users, other users on the CB chat lines. And there's been some research which actually does prove that there's around about 90% of these users just happen to be male, usually white and usually middle class. Um, so this, this is an interesting point. And, th and this other research, which was looking at MOOS, multi -orient orient object um, orientated um, sort of three-dimensional three virtual reality space, these um, sort of games which people can access. Um, they, once the characters, once, once characters that enter into those games specify whether they're male or female, uh, if they specify they're female, then they actually get subject to sexual harassment within those games, and they get subject to a lot of attention from the other male <coughs> players. And if they say they're male, then they just normally get left alone and completely ignored. So we're getting on to the, another alternative lifestyle <coughs> conversation. And they've discovered this character called the Phantom. And again, they're <coughs> playing around with the idea of um, that this character is obviously exploring maybe perhaps the idea of transforming their identity in some very real physical way. Right, and this is the last conversation where uh, they come across somebody called Looking for Action. And it, this sort of indicates the, the sort of spurious nature of the conversations that often get engaged um, in by users, particularly on alternative and gender lifestyle um, chat lines. Um, and he's asking here whether cis are a transvestite or bisexual, trying to pinpoint exactly where they're coming from. And normally within gen um, 
gender alternatives, it's usually men um, who are uh, cross-dressers who usually use this, uh, this line. And they're talking here, obviously, about the idea that it's safer to um, converse in this way when you've got absolutely no idea, no indication of the real identities behind um, other users. But I think the interesting thing here, and again this proves out some research which was recently produced, is that this character um, is sort of hinting that he's bisexual and then he owns up to being he's a married bi um, and he says that his wife doesn't know that he's bisexual. But then right at the end, uh, when, they're pu when he's pushed, uh, he then says he's not really bisexual, uh, that he just likes fantasising about being bisexual. And, um, and that this is another interesting phenomenon about computer chat lines, where in, although characters often enter into these chat lines by saying that, um, by assuming different identities, uh, within a few moments of being engaged in conversation, nine times out of ten, they just get back to their, their actual reality. Um, but this is something that um, the artists um, are sort of interested in the trying to explore and press, and the way in which they try and develop their work in this context is to ask probing questions because it's a kind of very difficult material obviously for artists to explore since they're working in real time. They don't know the response of uh, other, conf other, the res the other respondents within the systems. Uh, so they really don't know what they're going to come up with. Um, and one final point which I want to say about this, this work is that um, in terms of, an, of producing it as a, for an exhibition format, the artists are thinking about making it in the form of an electronic sound piece uh, using an electronically produced voice, which um, is therefore void of any kind of gender or sexual uh, positioning and void of any kind of material identity so that you can't actually fix it in any way. OK, well, that's my presentation over. Now it gives me a great pleasure to introduce to you Christine Tamblin, who um, is a conceptual artist and critic she teaches at the San Francisco State University and has been a performance and visual artist and is now entering the realm of computer art. The CD-ROM which she has created, She Loves It, She Loves It Not, Women, Women and Technology, is, I'm sure you will agree by the end of this afternoon, one of those titles which we hope will be available in Dixon's and Curry's at any moment, along with How to Play Better Golf and um, the other titles which seem to be invading those stores. Christine, hello. So uh, today I'm doing a particular performance um, of my CD-ROM. This is not really the optimum situation for viewing it because it is really designed by the nature of its format to be a one-on-one -on -one kind of presentation, but it is available in the Electronic Cafe um, in that form. Um, also, um, as you'll soon see, um, the video projector degrades the image to a great extent. So for that reason, um, I'm using slides um, as well as the video projector. So this may be a kind of a carnivalesque experience as I click through the slides and click through the CD-ROM and talk. Um, it's very multimedia. Uh, so, um, I want to emphasize in this presentation the rhetoric of science and fiction because that's the ostensible topic of this panel. Uh, so the subject of, of the CD-ROM is women's exclusion from the technological realm historically, but it also tries to construct a revisionist history in order to create a place for women in technology. <clears throat> And as such, it inv involves the elision of boundaries, the boundary between body and machine, and um, also the boundary between criticism and art. Uh, in my practice, I've tried to fuse criticism and art in many different modes as a performance and video artist. But I have found some unique things about the CD-ROM format, especially when uh, co comparing it to publishing criticism. And there are many um, taboos and inhibitions and conventions around writing criticism. And I found that um, it's necessary to exclude certain discursive registers like the personal voice. But with the CD-ROM, I can in a very fluid way switch back and forth from uh, writing in an autobiographical way to writing um, about historical data or theoretical speculation. So um, I will now launch this 
And you'll see how it begins. The title, She Loves It, She Loves It Not, is also echoed by the initial image, which is a daisy. So, of course, it refers to the ambivalence of plucking petals from a daisy, that game. I have prepared some performance loops about women in relation to technology. You will be able to click the mouse on picture icons to see movies, read letters, and get information from a robot guide. In order to advance to the next screen, please click on my mouth. <laughs> I notice my lips turn green. This screen gives you information to use so later. So this is the help screen to continue, that explains the different kinds of buttons. Click on the square button in the lower left Everything corner. Everything that's hot, i.e. interactive in this, is a little animation. And it includes uh, an agent button, a letter button, a movie button, as well as the um, navigation buttons. The breathing is um, a somewhat tongue-in-cheek um, device to make it seem more alive, more organic. <laughs> so um, the idea is you can click on these pedals and there are 12 different sort of chapters or paths. Um, so we're going to start out with the ideology one. Their um, memory, control, power, communication, violence, homunculus, labyrinth, interactivity. The ideology the other, loop outlines representation, some philosophical issues raised and by credits. robotics. Click the forward arrow on my picture to continue. Click the. So this screen is about. It looks like you're going backwards. This screen is about male birth envy and the invention of robots. It was interesting to um, hear Joan Truckenbrod talk about um, the womb as, you know, a metaphor for immersive experience, because I do believe that subconsciously um, a lot of what is driving this research um, and what causes a lot of the fervor about it is a desire for um, immortality, and specifically a um, men's part, the um, envy of women's uh, ability to give birth and wanting to somehow um, stimulate that. So um, each of the 84 screens in this has um, a QuickTime movie that you can look at. And the QuickTime movies are derived from Hollywood science fiction um, and from industrial and commercial films. A lot of films about domestic technologies um, from the 50s. Each screen um, has a, a predominant comic book image. It's laid out a lot like um, a magazine page, as you can see. Or um, the other sources for the images are old issues of Life magazine, works by contemporary artists, scientific texts, and computer magazines. So um, what the text says here is, um, Frankenstein is a story written by a woman about the consequences of male ambitions to co-opt the procreative function. Frankenstein is a reanimated corpse, an undead assemblage of used body parts. The true marriage of the human form and technology is death. So here we have um, Beauty and the Robot Beast. Um, and it says, robots in film and fiction were often depicted as behaving in a bestial manner. There was no more appealing motif for the narrativization of robotic bestiality than the recasting of the myth of Beauty and the Beast, with the robot standing in for the beast. I'll show you this clip, um, which um, is a good example of the paranoia that I think is projected by humans, um, projecting aggressive impulses onto um, computers. But with love. And here Never. a human refuses the computer's um, offer of love. <laughs> Oops. 
In time, you will come to regard. <laughs> I just uh, accidentally clicked on it again, but uh, uh, one of the um, one, one of my criteria for choosing these um, quick time never. movie excerpts was. Um, choosing uh, excerpts that used a lot of special effects because I had this feeling that the special effects sections were these moments within fairly banal narrative films in which some kind of um, hyperbolic excess, you know, some kind of libidinal investment came through in a different way that didn't necessarily have anything to do with the um, ostensible thing that was going on. Uh, the next um, loop I'm going to show you is the power loop. Uh, feminists have identified men's monopoly of technology as an important source of their power. Women's exclusion from the access to technological prowess is a crucial element of dependence on men. Their power um, one of the ways this is frequently Looking imaged in Hollywood films um, is through um, operating mark. room scenes um, in which the invasion of the body um, through some kind of technological means is um, imaged. mother has. Of course it would. And I'm looking forward to having an electric dryer, too. <laughs> Just think. Then we'd have a complete electric laundry. Wee! Wee? <laughs> what? Oh, goodbye, old wash day. That's why the wee! The communication loop explores the potential computers. The have communication to loop was influenced by um, Avatel Rennell's book, The Telephone Book. Um, and one of the things that she deals with in this is the link between the invention of the telephone by Alexander Graham Bell and the Victorian era in which it occurred, in which there was a great predilection for spiritualism and seances and uh, links across space and time um, of that sort. This is one of my um, special favorites, this clip. It's from Future World, and it's images in a very graphic way, the way that people's fantasy lives are sucked out of them um, through things like advertising in the media and then sold back to them. So this woman is actually on an operating room table and uh, her fantasy is being recorded um, at this moment. We're losing it. She's waking up. Better give her a moment. Real life is a shock after that. Yeah, I'll bet. You have reached the end of this loop and will return to the daisy menu. So it has a recursive structure. Um, every one of these series of screens is, is a loop that takes you back to the central menu. And that um, design was also influenced by um, Donna Haraway's ideas about uh, paradigms uh, that for um, uh, how things work that don't that aren't apocalyptic, that don't depend on some kind of um, grand climax, um, but that instead um, uh, are more um, cyclical. The interactivity loop debunks myths about the, interactivity loop the supposed myths interactivity, about the interactivity of, of uh, computers. Of computers. I mean, uh, the potential for interactivity is actually quite limited. And also, um, 
this clip is about um, the connection between um, the development of these technologies and uh, consumerism and uh, sort of Cold War equations of um, choice and um, buying power and individuality, the American way. in these uh, commercials and industrial films is an equation uh, between women's liberation and the invention of these um, new domestic technologies. And this one is a good example of that. need for the bride to feel tragic. The rest is push-button magic. So whether you bake or boil so I think there's a masturbatory thrill in pushing buttons, whether it's the buttons on your blender or clicking the mouse. have these um, personal meditations um, like this one. Quenching thirst is the most primal human need. Initially, it is fulfilled at the mother's breast. When I was about five, my mother began to send me to the corner of the street where we lived to buy milk from a square machine painted to resemble a giant milk carton. This is how I learned that machines could substitute for mothers. <laughs> So they're all handwritten, but you know it's really a simulation of, of the personal and sincerity because it's it's not my real handwriting; it's a you know digital um, encoding of it. You have reached the end of this loop and we'll return to the daisy menu. <coughs> um, I, I, I envision a multifaceted um, distribution strategy for this, and actually that's already happening, but not only can it be shown as an installation, but it can also be sold to individuals who have a powerful enough computer to view it, um, and it can be used as an instructional resource um, in universities. Um, I've made uh, 275 copies, um, which are almost gone. I have a few with me in case anybody um, wants to purchase one. Um, and I'm currently um, negotiating with some distributors about it. But I think that one of the most important messages I want to get across is the idea of democratizing access to publishing. It's very much like the early days of guerrilla video or of the independent press um, in that it's important that individuals feel like they can get involved in doing this so that, it, uh, that the only kind of models that exist aren't just made by corporations. Um, I did get um, an equipment grant from San Francisco State University to do this, but um, it only cost $1,300 once I had access to the equipment to make it to press um, the 275 copies. So it's really quite cheap um, compared to producing you know, a high quality um, artist's video or certainly a film. Um, <clears throat> And the interface is actually quite simple. Uh, the computer isn't disguised with any um, installation trimmings. And my goal was to make the interface as transparent as possible because I wanted to emphasize the content of the piece instead of providing a lot of fancy bells and whistles and gimmicks that call attention to themselves. It seems to me that computer art can only be experienced as something besides a novelty or a flashy new toy when the interface is that banal. Not the content, but the interface. Um, and I'm wary about all the rhetoric about interactivity because it's actually um, a very fascistic, predetermined kind of scheme. I mean, the programmer really decides um, what the nature of the interactivity can be, at least um, insofar as the technology has progressed. And of course, we're always in this mode of delayed gratification. You know, the technology is always going to 
quickly progress and any problems that exist now will be solved in that mythical future. But um, I think we need to put all of this in perspective. Um, uh, you know, it's true people have mentioned things like the telephone as um, a paradigm for using technology, but I just read a statistic the other day that said that if you look at it on a worldwide basis, only 20% of the homes um, in the world have even telephones. So, you know, access to this new technology is probably only going to increase the gap between the haves and the have-nots. Um, it's, people even say that um, in terms of the virtual body that people who can afford it will increasingly have um, uh, all kinds of artificial prostheses and they'll, they'll be kind of completely reinvented and so they'll be almost like two species of human beings, you know, just like the c kind of possible coexistence between Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal man, you know, there'll be this kind of post-human species and then the other people who can't afford all the um, technological um, improvements. Um, another um, rhetorical aspect of this technology that interested me is that I could include many different and even contradictory arguments in it. Um, I've never liked the way that when you're doing um, ordinary discursive writing, you're supposed to ha make a point and stick to it. You know, so I could sort of sample different schools of feminist thought in this rather than having to make a commitment to you know essentialist feminism or cultural feminism or whatever. Um, I think there are various um, exciting potentials for um, electronic writing in that regard. Post-structuralist theory views writing not just a mo as a mode of passively reflecting the self, but also as a tool for dynamically creating the self. Electronic writing in particular creates a more ephemeral self that changes each time it's read. So it's an appropriate medium for constructing a decentered subject or an identity that is multiply locatable. The persona of the electronic text is not stable or unified. Electric ri writing reflects its refusal of, of logocentrism in its ephemeralness. Its organizing mode is a network of loosely associated differences rather than a logical progression towards a single unvarying truth. That was my uh, grand finale, as I'm sure you could tell. On the um, note of interactivity, which Christine wanted to point out, the programmer decides. Perhaps we can refer back to an older form of, uh, of technology, an older kind of virtual world, which is created by the author of a book. And I'd like to introduce Pat Cadogan, a science fiction novelist, whose latest novel, Fools, will be published by HarperCollins on Monday. Pat. Can you all hear me out there in Kent or wherever? <laughs> I know, another American with no sense of geography. Well, as a, as a science fiction writer, I, maybe I can steer this. Oh, I made a big noise now. <laughs> as, a, as a science fiction writer, I, I had many options open to me as to what I would focus on in my work. And um, there was, you know, like I could write escapist stuff about, you know, let's get the hell off this planet and go to a better world. Or I could uh, do something real paranoid about aliens are among us and I married a monster from outer space and my in-laws are even worse. <laughs> or, um, you know, mostly I, I did choose to focus on the near future, say like the next 50 to 150 years, it's like the oh Christ what next approach. So now the one thing that all of these types of science fiction have in common with each other as well as with other kinds of literature is that there, it's really all, um, what did I write here? Oh, primitive virtual reality. It looked like permanent, but I knew that couldn't be right. <laughs> now I'm not gonna stand up here and tell you that the printed word is the first form of virtual reality and it's the best form of virtual reality and it should be preserved at all costs. Although I really would like to stay in print as long as possible. But in my own personal criterion for judging the quality of any book is if I was reading along in it and the page disappeared and I was watching the movie in my head, that was good writing. You know, that was my virtual reality. So, and when I first encountered the idea of virtual reality by way of technology, you know, I immediately began producing virtual reality about virtual reality. 
so for so far, um, all of my novels have had to do with some form of virtual reality. Have I said the words virtual reality enough times? <laughs> Sorry. Um, but my second novel, Sinners, which is spelled S Y N N E R S. Now there was one time I was on this panel with John Brunner, and he asked me the, no the name of my book, and I said Sinners with a Y. And he got up and he said, "This is Pat Cadigan. She's the author of a book called Sinners with a Y." <laughs> so I just try to spell it from now on. Um, but that book was directly concerned with the practical applications of virtual reality as entertainment. You know, let's face it, we've done some of our best work as a species just trying to relieve our own boredom and ennui and Weltschmerz. It's real hard to say a word like Weltschmerz with an accent like this. Well, I gave my virtual reality some virtual residents. Um, you know, what's the virtual world without a virtual population? Including people who kind of had dual citizenship in both. And uh, in there and out here. And later on, after the fact, when I was kind of looking at the book in retrospect, I realized that I had identified two kinds of people in terms of virtual reality. The people who wanted to bring the reality, the whole picture, from in here out there and show it to everybody. And the people who wanted to climb in in there and pull the door shut behind them. So maybe that's really, you know, um, what virtual sex is. You know, it's like which way you go. Are you in or out? Um, maybe that's gender in cyberspace, you know. Um, if there does really uh, turn out to be those particular divisions between people, um, um, it's ridiculous to talk about which is better, you know. It's like, is it better to go in or is it better to go out? Um, the best thing to do would be to try and engineer some way in which both types of people could coexist in something close to peace. Although, now I've lived long enough uh, to know that the universe is not only stranger than we imagine, but it's stranger than we can imagine. And I'm probably being short-sighted in identifying only two types. You know, perhaps the future of VR is more than bisexual. And perhaps in the future, gender really will be more of a job description rather than a designation of your particular genitalia. Now, in Fools, my novel, which was most recently published here, I realized that I had made VR inextricably intertwined with identity, a sense of self. And if you think about it, are you different in different places? Is the you who goes to the bank different from the, from the you that goes to the party? And if it isn't, how's your credit rating? <laughs> you know, we spend our lives listening to externals tell us who we are. We're young, hip-happening people who know what we want and aren't shy about going out to get it. Or we're mature, wise individuals who deserve the best life has to offer. Or you're a man of the 90s or a woman who isn't afraid to make her needs known. And I don't know about you, but, you know, I'm really flattered until I think about the fact that all these companies are really sucking up to me just so I'll buy their soap. Anyway, in Fools, world marketing has bypassed the product and it's gone right to identity. Why bother trying to get someone to cough up the money to be represented by an expensive icon like a Cadillac where you can just sell someone the person that they want to be? Why buy designer clothes like Cindy Crawford? Why not just be Cindy Crawford? But of course, you're not really Cindy Crawford. You're just a re in a reality in which that's who you are, aren't you? Or are you deluded? Well, I can't answer that question. Maybe I refuse to answer that question on the grounds that I might incriminate myself or delineate myself or commit myself. The fact is, I don't want to give you the answers, even just my theoretical answers, and I don't want yours. What I want and what I think that we should all seek from life and from reality, virtual or deluded, from our dreams and fears, externalized or not, is suggestions for new questions. I don't want another answer. I want a new question. I want to ask a question that no one's ever asked before. 
And to that end, I leave you with the two thoughts that drive me and that have always driven me all my life in my writing. One from Kurt Vonnegut, we become what we pretend to be, so we must be very careful about what we pretend to be. And from E.E. E. Cummings, listen, there's a hell of a good universe next door. Let's go. Thank you. Thank you.